The frontier is defined as uncharted territory by land or notion. Those who chart that territory tell a story. The past illustrates the blueprint for the present. How things are and how they've evolved. From land to water, we are challenged to border that new frontier. A frontier the outdoorsman knows like no other. Author Gary Lewis works his way along that edge of where discoveries, failures, and achievements have written the story of the sportsman. Yes! Yes! From state to state, continent to continent, the stories told create the foundation of the present, and they lay the framework for the future. Through the muzzle fire and on the stone are stories from the edge. Water is the most important thing as far as Indians are concerned, that's, that's life. The past is written, the present is here, and this is Frontier Unlimited. Gary Lewis and John Norris are on Thumbtack Ranch in South Texas, exploring an organization that gives back to children and veterans and is a model for wildlife conservation. We see white-tailed deer all over the place. The, the white tail is almost sacred here in Texas. Definitely. And then there's the axis deer, black buck, the sheep, the trans Transcaspian urials. Yeah. We have Nilgai, we have scimitar horned oryx, we have Gems buck, and then javelina, wild hogs, which the wild hogs are a problem, but uh, we still have people that want those for like dream trips. That's another program we have where we bring out people battling life-threatening or terminal illness and get them in the outdoors to finish their, you know, their bucket list to do yeah. the dream trips they want to do. Yeah, so this is, it gives them an opportunity to be out here. And some of those people are struggling financially while they're dealing with the illness and then there's never any cost for anything Trinity Oaks does it's about giving back and impacting lives it's not about taking anything the Thumbtack Ranch plan for kids and healing veterans benefits wildlife habitat and conservation but there's a darker side of the story near the border John we're here in Texas we're hunting hogs we're down by the border with Mexico and the cartel is operating here like they operate where I live, where you're from. Everywhere, yeah, all throughout the U.S. As we're hunting here, how does this relate to your work as a game warden in conservation? You know, being a conservationist, Gary, and, and being a game warden, you got to have certain skill sets to be effective. And those skill sets are patience, especially, because you got to sit and wait on bad guys, you know, sometimes for days at a time. And then just understanding, you know, everything from topography and tracking, lay of the land, scent, and how to get in and out of areas quietly. And growing up as a hunter and an angler, we all learn those skills very early, you know, passed down generationally, and it just makes us better game wardens, better law enforcement officers. And when you talk about the cartel element that we uh, have to chase throughout not only California and Oregon and down here in Texas, but throughout the whole country, those guys are really, really good at their area. I mean, they, they know field craft, they know stealth, they're super quiet, and they're super patient because they're out there living in their grow sites for five, six, seven months out of the year. So if we don't have those skills, we're not gonna be effective to catch them. We learn this stuff as hunters, but as being a warden and facing these poison marijuana grows and, and going into those areas, you're dealing with a level of patience and intensity that is that's another step ahead. Yeah. And you have to adjust culturally because there's you have to understand your quarry. Yeah, you have to, you have to, you broke it down and, and said it perfectly. When you're dealing with the, the cartel grower element, a little different than your traditional poacher that we, you know, do in traditional game warden work, think about. I mean, these guys are, they live in a, you know, kind of a culture of chaos and violence. Violence is commonplace. Um, obviously, they have a multi million dollar black market enterprise, and the profit margin there is uh, worth defending. And sometimes they'll defend it with their lives and they'll go to guns, and we've had some violence, as you well know. So, being out and 
in an area here like Texas and having a hunt with you and, and sharing this amazing experience as a conservationist just helps reinforce those skills to be aware of what's going on around us and better at catching them when we need to. One of the things that you helped me understand and your books helped me understand was the poison that they bring into the United States in, in the form of these pesticides that kill everything they come in contact with. When you're up in these, these streams that are the headwaters of critical steelhead spawning, they're killing those fish. Yeah, they're, they're, this stuff is nasty, Gary. Like I, I go into it, especially in, in my new book, Hidden War, I really go into putting photographs of what this stuff looks like, what we call pink death. Products like Metafos, Carbofuran Bay, stuff that's so deadly, the EPA banned it from general use in America almost 20 years ago. I mean, two tablespoons of this stuff can kill several miles of creek and every steelhead trout and aquatic within it. And one 12 ounce container can kill 2,600 people. This stuff is just, uh, just horribly nasty. And not only on uh, killing wildlife or being a human health factor if we run across it, but decimating what you just said, waterways for miles, yeah. contaminating a, you know, a grow site and all the environmental impacts around it, all our wildlife, wildland and waterway species. Some of the places that I've hunted in California, I've come across PVC pipe yeah, and, and old milk jugs yep. and stuff like that. And when I see that, I think, oh man, I'm, I'm in or I'm near a, one of these sites. And so there's a level of awareness just as a hunter that I need to have. Exactly. But that's the kind of thing that you're trained to notice and, and to look for. Yeah, we, we look for that and something we also, um, you know, as just educators and public safety educators especially, as well as, you know, environmental protectors is educating to what to look for, what we call growth site indicators. And you just hit it on the head, you know, how many people over on the West Coast and throughout the 25 other states we, we hear about that see what you just saw? black poly pipe just going along a ridge yeah. line randomly in the middle of the forest. Well, the good good chance that's a, a trespass, illegal growth site, yeah. probably cartel runs. So when you see something like that as a hunter, you wanna get out of the area, document it, get a photograph of it, make sure you can you know articulate where it was and get out safely and report it because who knows how big that growth site is and who knows uh, how deadly those guys are gonna be up ahead You know, if you follow that water line to, to something really nasty. These aren't simply marijuana growth sites. These are poisoned marijuana growth sites. And so the product that hits the street is carrying this residue. It is, it is. And, and this is the horrible part about it. We don't only see those poisons in the growth site going onto the, into the water, going on the plants themselves, but it's on all the bud product, all the flour that unknown, you know, unsuspecting users all over the black market in America are ingesting and they have no idea they're ingesting deadly poisons. So they think um, it's natural, but they're putting this poison into their body. Exactly. And, and you know, certainly our cartel growers uh, aren't organic. They're not really going green. You know, we've never, uh, never seen that concern for human health from, from that criminal element. So it, if this stuff makes it out of the forest and makes it into circulation, um, people could die. It's that bad. After Norris and Pike harvested their pigs a couple days prior, Lewis was hoping to find the boar to put down and get in the cooler, or run into the axis buck that evaded them a day prior.
And who knows what we're going to see next. There are many ways to hunt wild hogs. Blind hunting is one of them, which requires stillness, silence, and attention. Time is another factor. Knowing the yardage to a shot through the shooting lines. Here in West Texas, there's ranches like this, and this is a, a really good example of thoughtful management. Yeah, conservation model. You have the habitat that animals thrive. Right. And I can't help but think we could do better on public land, but we're hampered by a lot of things, like ignorance, for sure. Drug grows, sure. play, play into that, right? Uh, because a, we allow them through ignorance, and b, they take up land that belongs to the public and is supposed to be there for the use of the wildlife. But when they kill the wildlife to protect their plants, right. then. We lose, the public loses. And that's that's a part of the difference between this habitat, which is well managed, and the unmanaged, to a high degree, unmanaged public land. Yeah, that's it exactly, Gary. And you know, we're always trying to get more water, more cover on our public land areas that have been impacted just with, you know negative land use and then you factor in say drug cartel activity and you don't only take out the wildlife and destroy the waterways and poison everything that's there in that growth site but you have the downstream effects you know you get these epa banned poisons in the waterways and they go down and stretch out and destroy five miles of aquatics and creeks think of all the wildlife that for miles are impacted so for miles and for years yeah and for years and you just said it well where you can't get that back right away. I mean, you decimate one creek and all the steelhead, all the aquatics, all our big game, small game that are feeding off of that, you are, you're gonna lose them literally for years, if not forever. So the impacts are exponential and, uh, and stopping that to get our public lands back is critical. With another day passed, Lewis begins to feel a slight pressure to harvest a boar or a deer that he set out for. With one afternoon and one evening left, Norris and Lewis get into their last blind for the day with hopes of connecting with the animal that gives them the opportunity. It's the last day, is it? We are back here in the um, same blind where you got your pig. You yeah, on first, first night. night. Yeah. yeah, And we know there's a lot of pigs here. We've also been told that this is an access deer spot where they see a lot of access deer. And we hope that happens. <laughs> but if it doesn't, yeah. I'm gonna shoot a pig because, or I'm gonna try because they want them. They want the numbers not down, you know, so it's important for their habitat management. Yeah, we've definitely seen a lot of pigs on this ranch, Gary, since night number one. It's been awesome, but like you said, with the balance of all the other species on this great conservation management ranch, they're going to hinder that growth. Oh yeah, dude, that's... Oh, just busted. He's going to come back around. Yeah, I think so. He's a pretty good buck. Yeah. Really big in the body. Yeah, he was big body for sure. He wasn't. 
It wasn't real big antlers. Let's keep an eye on that little doe and see yeah. if she flags on that buck coming out. Yeah, he might come around like that hog did the other night. Right. See if come into that protein feeder. Protein. Fading afternoon light, white tails surround the feeders the hogs once were. A gentle breeze through the blind passes Lewis and Norris's face as they look intently to find the animal that gives them the opportunity. All those other deer laughed. Yeah, they pushed out. Hawk right there is watching something that is not us. Really agitated. Left of the feeder, there's a white tail buck. Left of the white tail buck is in the axis. An axis deer shows itself near the feeder, which is a good indication that an axis buck might show up. Yeah, that's a that's good. No, that's a shed buck. Oh, it is a shed buck. Look. Oh, there's a there's an axis. You're close if you want to sit there. See if there's another one. Lewis shoulders his rifle, takes aim, steadies, and presses the trigger. Blood on the ground, it's apparent that the Axis buck was hit. First signs off the trail, cutting back this way. He got solid blood starting here, and that was that big hook. And he came around right here. Okay, so way. that's where he hooked, all right. Yep. With daylight fading, they made the call to bring in the hounds, and they were two hours out. And on the way back, the hogs were there. Pushing pigs. Wow. Big one? Yeah, you bet. Okay, it looks like there's a, there's a peak. On the deck. Dead pig. Good shot, Gary. Good shot, sir. <laughs> way to go. Well done, bud. Thanks. A nice pig down. Right at last light. Perfect. <laughs> Good job. Ha! Yeah. Nice. Perfect eater. Nice. Yes. Thank you. 
<laughs> well done, brother. Way to get him, man, on the 11th hour. <laughs> right then, I love it. Good job. All right. With the hounds en route, they harvested a good cooler pig to bring back to Oregon and share it with family. His dog just got a GPS on him with their name. You know how far they are. And then I got the bird's eye downloaded on this. It bird's eye like Google Earth. You can see the lay of the land. You see that little old draw right there. When the hounds stopped moving on the GPS tracker, that's when they knew they had found the deer. We've come to the spot the dog said that it was. And uh, now we're going after in with light. There he is. Yeah, baby. Oh, man. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Beautiful animal. Gorgeous. Yeah. With the hounds that found the deer, Lewis, who had harvested his meat pig, and two pigs taken the day prior from Norris and Pike, Trinity Oaks shares a model of conservation and care for the sportsman that is unrivaled in South Texas. 